Aloha. Welcome to this show, Politics for the People. And uh, I am Stephanie Stoldalchin, your host for this weekly show. Uh, Today's uh, topic is uh, but Biden's pushback uh, through sanctions on Russia, which has turned into a war to seize and control um, its neighbor, Ukraine, uh, actually in the last 24 hours. So to discuss uh, the topic, uh, we have a panel of guests, and uh, the panel today is Jay Fidel, welcome, and Karen Buzzard, welcome. Thank you for participating. Now, um, Putin's war is already 24 hours old, with destruction and casualties mounting as we are talking here. So, Jay, did diplomacy and revealing and removing all Putin's surprise tactics and uh, threatening sanctions fail? Yes. Is it? Yes. I mean, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but here we are. And I think Putin never intended to be sidetracked with diplomacy. He, he wants to, uh, you know, advance his agenda. He wants to take this territory and he is taking the territory and the rest of it is propaganda. Um, is uh... If, if, if Putin dismissed all diplomatic asks and sanctions threats, then, okay, so clarify what you think his aims are. Uh, how about, uh, Karen, can you comment on that? What are his aims? Uh, I think his aim is to um, keep uh, Ukraine a non-NATO member, or whatever you call it, because the criteria for a NATO member is to be a democracy. So if he can kind of keep these conflicts going, then it, you know, it's sort of a pseudo democracy now, but, um, uh, but he wants to be sure that it's kind of kept off kilter. And also he wants to assure that he has access to the Black Sea, which is if you look at the countries that NATO is going after, they all surround the Black Sea including Ukraine. So he does not want to be cut off with the access to the Black Sea by NATO bases once they become a NATO country. So, um, Karen, can you review what were um, Ukraine's intentions? How far did they get in wanting to be uh, NATO? What, what, what's the status of that request? Or if there was a re ever request? Well, it's not really been a, it's considered, I think it's, uh, classified as a, I can't remember the term, a uh, pseudo democracy or something. They have a term for it, which means they do have an elected official president and everything, but I believe the elected official controls the courts and picks the judges and so forth. So it's uh, sort of like the US <laughs> almost, but <laughs> so there's like, a, a, there's part of it that's kind of democratic, but part of it isn't democratic. So it's kind of borderline democratic at the moment. Okay, well, not to uh, get too hung up on this, but I was thinking that you would talk about whether Ukraine actually request, did they get to the point of requesting to be in NATO? So uh, having to do with, you know, the Putin's uh, issue that they, he doesn't want them in NATO. Now, when did they ever request to be, did they ever move in that direction? I don't think they can request it until they meet the NATO. There's certain criteria you have to meet to be a NATO member, and they haven't met the criteria yet. Oh, that's okay. All right. That's interesting because um, I've heard so much about their economy, et cetera. But anyway, okay, that's that's helpful. All right. Then, um, you know what, Jay, does, um, does hardening our West, the West response to this illegal and unjustifiable violent incursion into another country, if we try to harden the uh, response uh, or increase the threats, do, is, does that mean uh, risking nuclear war? Well, it depends on how far you go, doesn't it? Um, right now, uh, he did some pretty, um, pretty strong things this morning. That is uh, President Putin, President Biden. He did some pretty strong things in terms of the sanctions. What he didn't do uh, was cut Russia off from the SWIFT money transfer program. And he's holding back on that. I guess uh, he thinks uh, that, that, that better to have that in his pocket to use that later because it, it will have a profound effect on 
um, not only the economy of Russia, but the economies of all the world, because um, you can't travel, you know, can't transfer money to or from Russia. Um, I think I think one, and by the way, uh, Mitch McConnell is with him, but beyond him. Uh, Mitch McConnell made a statement this morning that he thought that Biden ought to, you know, pull out the stops, that he ought to use every sanction available, including the swift, terminating the swift money connection um, system uh, in order to make the point. So uh, it's okay. It's all right. He's done what he can do. He's he's held the one really powerful thing in his pocket yet. There are probably other powerful things in his pocket. I'm not sure that um, that Putin has, you know, that's going to surprise Putin. Putin has already figured out what Biden can do uh, and when and why. And he's probably a step ahead of him. He's a smart guy. So um, uh, to go to your original question, you know, have, have, have the sanctions worked? Well, they didn't stop him from entering uh, Ukraine. They didn't stop him from, you know, moving his troops and his tanks and whatnot into Ukraine and blowing up all the um, you know, Ukraine military facilities didn't stop them. And the question is whether SWIFT or anything else at this point is going to stop them. So if you go to war, you know, uh, this morning, uh, Biden said he was putting another 8,000 troops uh, on the western border of Ukraine. Um, that's threatening. I'm not sure Biden where the... Or, or, um, was it Biden or um, is putting troops in Ukraine? On the western, Biden, Biden, Biden. Oh, I thought you meant um, Putin. No, no, Biden is moving eight thousand troops to the western border of Ukraine, which yeah. is which is, uh, which is pretty, you know, it's threatening, and it suggests that uh, you know, just as they put, <laughs> as they put one hundred and seventy-five or two hundred thousand troops on the eastern, northern, southern borders of Ukraine, we put, you know, I don't know, ten or fifteen thousand troops. Uh, on the western borders, I, I mean, it, it bespeaks of of war. Whether it goes to nuclear war, I, I kind of doubt it. I think this will be a conventional war. If you want my expectations, Stephanie, yes. what what will happen here is um, is uh, ostensibly, um, but uh, Putin will take over Ukraine. He will. He has invaded Ukraine. He will take over Ukraine. Uh, he will arrest anybody okay. um, who opposes him. He will seize the government, put a puppet government in, all within a few days. But that's not the end of it, because this will be a long-term permanent smoldering condition where you have um, underground resistance uh, by many, many people in Ukraine. They have done this before, uh, where they, they will attack the Russians when they get the chance. It's, it's not going to go to a... Uh, uh, you know, a peaceful uh, situation um, for a long time, if ever. Yeah, and I want At the same time, I think I think it's um, a great threat to Western Europe. Let me add that if you look at the map, you know, with with all regard to uh, the analysis that um, Putin is is uh, concerned about the NATO countries coming closer to him. Um, I think the NATO countries are very concerned about this move in Ukraine. If you look at a map, you will see that uh, Ukraine is like an arrowhead pointed directly into uh, Eastern and, for that matter, a part of Western Europe. Um, and if, if, if uh, Putin has control of um, Ukraine and he moves troops to the west of Ukraine and missiles and the like and you know, war materiel, he will be in a great place to put political pressure to express power uh, right in the middle of Eastern Europe and uh, very close to Western Europe. So this that's a high stakes ball game. Uh, but to answer your question, I don't think we're going to a nuclear war. It'll be a, a ground war and it will be a very regrettable war. And a lot of people will die and, and it will change things that the three of us cannot possibly expect right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen, going back to Biden, if um, he, he's been under criticism for not invoking and applying the sanctions sooner. In, in fact, 
even from the president, the Zelensky seemed to question, why are you waiting for us to be destroyed before you are going to apply some of these threat sanctions you threat? So where do you think that issue stands now? Will he continue to be criticized for that or will that drop out and be um, of, of no use in the conversation or will it go on as a debate? What do you think? Well, I think it would have eliminated his negotiating power. You know, you apply the sanctions as a way to negotiate what you want. Uh, if you go ahead and apply it to begin with, then there's no ability to negotiate, you know, that you won't apply the sanctions if they, you know, do, do whatever they agree to. So I think it was um, a good step to wait because you had to see what Putin was going to do. Uh, there was a chance that they could have, you know, they were meeting regularly. There was a chance they could have reached some kind of negotiation. Well, wasn't there a credibility issue as far as Biden was concerned? It seemed like they thought that he wouldn't do it, that he's, and this is part, I guess, of his weak, uh, uh, weakness reputation um, or, or what impugned, impugned reputation by, the, by many GOP people. But um, wouldn't the um, applying the sanctions early allow you to stop them as, you know, as soon as nothing happened? I mean, by, wouldn't there be a date involved? In other words, is it just a, why, a yes, no thing? Or di didn't he have some leverage that he didn't use by having an early um, um, uh, application? Well, I guess if you don't want to negotiate, you just go ahead and apply the sanctions, you know, but it's just a matter of whether you think you can gain something through negotiation. Okay. I mean, you don't see that negotiation can include uh, some stimulus from sanctions or a little bit of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, encouraging, encouraging participation. Uh, then. You can, uh, go step by step, you know, and what you're um, using the sanctions for or something like that. And as part of the negotiation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, well, Jay, you know, getting back to the issues um, we're facing and that you, you went on and mentioned um, can, uh, well and clearly, um, are there any soft spots on Putin? Is, is there any soft spot or do we go to the other end of the spectrum where he might, he, he, is he maniacally driven? I mean, is the man crazy? Is there any one there? Well, even, even um, you know, even paranoids have real enemies. Um, I think he is uh, paranoid. I, I think he is maniacal, but um, he's got the ability to shape an argument, uh, however outrageous it is. And he's got the ability to control the Russian people, um, no matter how many lies he has to tell them. And he's got the ability to command a couple hundred thousand troops and all, all those missiles and weapons of all kinds that he has accumulated, even in a down economy. It's really, you know, it, it, a footnote to that is why do that in an economy that's failing in Russia? You know how much money he's spending on this adventure? And then I say to myself, wait a minute, at the same time we see his, his, uh, his adventure in uh, Eastern Europe, we find a report uh, from, I guess it was uh, some scientists, um, that, um, that, that there'll be more wildfires all over the world. Uh, that climate change is getting worse faster than we thought. Um, they say, we, it, it, as a test of humanity, are we passing? No. We are occupied in these incredible, violent, destructive, murderous adventures by Putin. And uh, we, we don't have time or opportunity or money uh, to deal with the, the biggest threat, the existential threat of all, climate change. Uh, you know, this is like takes us off the path completely for as long as it lasts. Everybody in Europe and for that matter, the U.S., although the U.S. kind of, you know, declined in its interest. Uh, in climate change. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is so destructive, it's hard to believe. And I was telling you, um, you know, before, there's a comparison with Munich and appeasement and Chamberlain um, and Hitler, uh, except in that case, um, Hitler got Chamberlain to agree to let him come into, to let Hitler come into the Sudetenland. That may be in the offing here. That may be some kind of, quote, settlement, end quote, um, that takes place in the middle of all this murder. So uh, if that happens, it's really sort of an extension of the beginning of World War II. 
Um, and, and right now, I think the guys in Ukraine must think that that's a real possibility um, because they were surprised, you know, like the same kind of shock and awe type surprise uh, as in, in Poland in the Blitzkrieg in 1939. They're not really going to do it, but then they did it. So you ask me if he's a, he's a pathological case. He is, but he has always been determined to do this. And it was only a chess game, you know, with these um, negotiations, diplomatic uh, and treaties and the like. He always knew he was going to do this. It was only a, a matter of controlling his public and arming his army and bringing his army to the border. Um, and now he's doing it. Are we surprised? Well, uh, that's a, that's the question. Are there any more surprises? And uh, Karen, the um, some reports are that it is it is a, a loss for us that we removed some of the our Russian intelligence people there, or we had to. I think in two seventeen something came up, and we pulled um, the rest of the people out of it, those that were close to the Kremlin, or maybe we had to. But. Um, but as a result of that, we don't know about the situation surrounding Putin. And there's some speculation that he's fairly isolated because he's been sick and he's been afraid. He's very afraid of COVID and he's been staying away from everything and not going anywhere for really a long time. So it's considerable isolation. So the question is, is he getting any resource or guidance or other opinions. I mean, even dictators will have a, a council, right? Even if they're a little bit constrained and being totally authentic. But what do you think about those ideas that we don't know his state of mind? But there, it, it may be that he's in a particular place that is not healthy. What do you think? Uh, well, I think this is not a short-term issue. It's been an ongoing issue for many years. It started in 1999, when the US made a strategic decision to expand NATO into Eastern Europe. And there were warnings that even at the time, they went from 15 members to 30 members, most of them in Eastern Europe, that this was gonna have severe consequences, this new policy of expansion, particularly as, as I kind of poking the bear, you know, you're poking Putin because, uh, you know, basically you're beginning to threaten what they feel is the Russian security. So I think that has been a major factor, the NATO expansion and whether it was wise to expand it. The purpose of NATO originally after World War II was to keep the Russians out, to keep Germany down and to let the US kind of control. The US pretty much controls NATO. So I think this was a, a policy that had serious consequences. And then a second, uh, there's been kind of a shift in mission in NATO where uh, they no longer feel like they have to abide by the established treaties and uh, UN Security Council agreements. So uh, the examples of that, actually I saw the uh, former, one of the former uh, ambassadors to the Soviet Union, US ambassadors, to, and he was discussing the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he said what people didn't know at the time was that US had missiles in Turkey craned at uh, Russia uh, or Soviet Union at the time. So part of the negotiation was they would take the missiles out of Cuba in exchange, they would remove the ones from um, Turkey because they were, you know, they were they both felt where they were security threats. So I think the issue of, uh, you know, looking at security threats has to be looked at not just in the US security threats or Ukraine, but also Russia, they feel threatened. So I think um, some of these policies, uh, mission, they call it mission creep, where they've sort of gone beyond the, uh, as missions like they eliminated the anti-ballistic mission uh, missile uh, treaty in 2002 under George Bush. They've invaded Afghanistan and Iran without the support of the UN Security Council because Russia's on there. So they don't want to take anything to the Security Council because they have the right to veto it. And so I think the US has adopted uh, sort of an aggressive policy, if you will, through NATO. And um, this is not to excuse Putin, of course. Putin has his own issues, but I think that uh, it has to be put within a larger context than just he's not feeling well or something like that. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with that. I think there was a time when the US was being aggressive in NATO, but um, in recent years, that hasn't happened. It, it didn't, certainly, it didn't happen in 
in the uh, in the Trump years, uh, Trump was making friends with Russia. Trump was uh, alienating everybody in NATO and the EU. He was not trying to advance the border. He was not trying to attack Russian security. He didn't do anything against Russia. Um, and he's not doing anything against Russia now. He's criticizing Biden for being too aggressive in dealing with this and imposing sanctions. Um, so, you know, the U.S. has not threatened that border. And for that matter, I don't think NATO, at least not in recent years, not my recollection, had done anything to push into Russia. Um, and none of those countries, um, you know, have have threatened Russia. Russia is not threatened. Uh, so, I, you know, I would tend to think that. I'm sorry, what's threatening is not so much um, the fact that they're going to put uh, NATO bases in these countries with um, ballistic weapons. That's kind of what they consider threatening. Is, it, is that happening? Because NATO uh, has, I mean, has uh, economic NATO problems. It has had political problems with Trump. Joe Biden is not interested in advancing NATO to, to the east. He's not doing that. And uh, nobody is doing that. And uh, so I don't I don't think Russia has a legitimate concern, at least not in not in the last five or six years, maybe longer. Um, and, and I think I think what's happening here is um, he has a lot of reasons. Um, Putin does uh, to do what he's doing. I mean, rational reasons. And one of the one of them that that, that, that I catch and, and you mentioned it, Karen, uh, is that these countries are arguably democratic. Uh, maybe half democratic, but they they point toward democracy. Um, and that is very troubling because Putin is pointing away from democracy. Uh, if you look at the protests in Russia and Moscow a couple of years ago, there was actually a democracy movement. He has managed to squash that. He has managed to squash and poison his adversaries, his political adversaries, one after the other. Nobody, nobody can successfully oppose him in any election. You know, democracy is now dead in Russia. He has killed it, and it's recent. So when he looks to countries like the Ukraine, where um, democracy is actually emerging, and um, that people like it, he's very worried that will affect his power at home. And I think that is a, a hard, a hard driver of where he's going. I don't think it's so much the boundaries or the, um, you know, the, the contention with NATO or the American participation in NATO. I think it's democracy and he doesn't want it anywhere near him. Well, listen, let's, that's, those are really interesting points and um, thank you for them. I wanted to move over to talk about, in addition to NATO, uh, which we're covering, um, over to the UN and the um, poignancy of that, that uh, officer's uh, statement um, at, at the uh, UN meeting yesterday, the Security Council, you already mentioned that earlier, about uh, that, that making the point that uh, Russia no longer belongs uh, on the Security Council, given, as it, you're saying with NATO, the compliance with the principles and the, and the framework of it are no longer um, anything they believe in, obviously, given their actions. So, so Karen, can you speak to the UN and what what is it that it can do, and why can't it do anything? Don't they usually send blue helmets somewhere? But what do you happen to? Can you comment on the UN, please? Well, the UN includes Russia, so it has a veto vote. So I don't think it's a good if they want to really have a United Nations, they can't remove the remove the major you know, countries and really have a, um, then it just becomes the world against, you know, the countries they remove, whoever they decide to move, would they remove China next or, you know, so I think it's sort of a slippery slope then uh, if you don't agree with someone's policies, you just remove them from the United Nations. But the other thing I think, going back to a point Jay made is that I did see a, a, a poll recently yesterday that 50% of Americans don't think we should be pursuing this, that they think that we have other things we should be pursuing, such as climate change, and that we're getting distracted. And uh, of those, like 80% or 80% of independents feel like this should be between Russia and Ukraine and the US shouldn't be involved because technically it's not a NATO country. So we're only pledged to you know defend NATO countries. So they think, um, so I wonder how this is going to affect Biden politically uh, if he, you know, 
if he goes too far in this direction. Okay, that's a good point. Jay, that is a good point. And I, I tried to press to find out if you all had comments on when it was that uh, Ukraine had applied to be NATO because they're, they're kind of acting like a, a NATO member. Biden's making the point that they're not, and we, that's why we can't go in. But can you talk to the UN um, issue then, Jay, for the Security Council? Of no, I was really pathetic watching them last night. Um, you know, I, I, I give them credit to uh, the ones who spoke, the, 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 the UK representative, the Irish <coughs> representative, um, the American representative, you know, all very articulate, honorable, powerful statements, moral statements of, of, of a liberal world order. Remember that the United Nations was established after the war, before the war, there was no liberal order and you could take what you wanted. Uh, Karen made that point early. And, and that's the way life was um, before the United Nations was established. Its, it's most significant contribution uh, is to have a rules-based global community that you don't go and take what's next to you. Um, and, and so when the United Nations is threatened, that liberal world order that was created, that we created in uh, 1945 and six um, is, is jeopardized. And what you saw last night in the Security Council, however it's organized and however it can be changed or not, probably not, um, you, you, there, it's, um, it's, it's not working. Um, they can't take action against an obvious aggression. This is an aggression. This is an invasion. And if these guys, if Putin gets away with it, there'll be more. Somebody will decide for some crazy cockamamie reason, some historic, ancient cultural reason that he's entitled to the next, the next neighbor over, he will do it again. And the world order that was established after World War II, because of World War II, by the United Nations is in great jeopardy. I think the uh, Security Council is stuck I think, therefore, the United Nations is stuck. I think the, the usefulness of the United Nations going forward is in serious jeopardy. And that means the global liberal order is in serious jeopardy. I don't know what can be done about it. I, I don't know what should be done about it. Well, I know that we, we, we all benefit by having, um, you know, a liberal rules-based global national international order on the um, the issue of uh, politics uh, i think biden biden did a good job in revealing what he what he his intelligence community told him was happening in russia i agree we don't have that many agents on the ground back a few years ago um, and maybe it was because of uh, um, <clears throat> you know a revelation of american secret documents that turned out a bunch of our uh, spies and agents uh, that they had to leave or were killed. Uh, we didn't hear the detail of that. Um, but the fact is we don't have that much intelligence. On, on Putin, <clears throat> I, think, uh, I think I look at Putin and wonder who he talks to. He must have, you know, a lot of people around him are functionaries um, who really don't participate in the decision process. But there must be somebody. These are very complex issues. And remember, you know, he's an intelligence guy from back when. He must have intelligence people that he talks to about trying to play the, the chess game with Biden. Um, and I think that will continue. They may not be visible, uh, but they're there. And he talks to them. You can't do this by yourself. Um, really, no human being can do this by himself. Uh, finally, um, Mitch McConnell, who uh, today, you know, he's chameleon-like, uh, has said that he thinks that Biden ought to go further and knock off the, you know, the SWIFT system and the like. Um, and he's supporting uh, Joe Biden and, you know, and responding with vigor. Um, but bottom line is um, the, the GOP is determined to undermine Biden. Uh, if this at any point presents a way to embarrass Biden, um, undermine him politically, they will. And in fact, Trump is doing that on a regular drumbeat basis. Uh, it's really hideous that when Biden has challenges like this, Trump is on him like, like all over him um, to try to undermine him. And, and people will follow Trump. There's a million, tens of millions of people who buy this. 
and, and feel that we shouldn't be there. A lot of the uh, acolytes are saying we shouldn't be there, we shouldn't care, we have other problems at home, and it doesn't matter how the world order is doing. And um, I think that's a real serious threat to Biden's authority and ability, ability to get it done. I mean, to have a good result, which seems actually distant right now. Well, with uh, these comments um, on, on our circumstances at this time, uh, we were going to have to stop with this. And uh, it's not a pretty picture, uh, but uh, this we're out of time. And this is the Politics for the People show. It's weekly. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. And I thank Karen Buzzard and Jay Fidel for participation, vigorous participation. Thank you. And thank you to viewers. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.